Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Lon Schiffbauer, and today we are going to talk about culture and how culture influences international business, relations, organizations, things like that. So let's come over to our PowerPoint here, and let's first kind of introduce the idea of culture a little bit, if you will. I mean, after all, what is culture? You know, oftentimes, there's always words that we understand and we know and we use in in sentences and conversation. But if you really get down to it, can you define culture? So let's go ahead and do that. Now, a dictionary definition of culture that you're going to run into is something like this. Culture, a system of values and norms shared among a group of people that directs and justifies how the members operate, live, and behave. Now, there is a lot to this. Let me break it down a little bit. A system, okay? A culture is a full system, all interconnected. It's not just one or two things. It's all kinds of things, all influencing one another a system of values and norms. We are going to explore what we mean by values and norms. Shared among a group of people. Anytime you have two or more people together, there is a culture present. And this system directs, directs how people behave. But interestingly, check this out, also justifies how people behave. It's one thing to have a culture direct how we behave, but to actually lend some sort of moral justification to what we do, that is the power of culture. And so we are directed and we are justified in how we operate, live, and behave. Okay? Now, one of the ways I like to look at culture is much as how Morpheus in The Matrix described The Matrix. He might say, culture is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. Culture truly does permeate every aspect of our lives. And furthermore, in many ways, it's quite invisible. Or if it's visible, we're so used to seeing it that we don't see it anymore. I kind of like to look at it as a computer's operating system. Of course, the software that we see in front of us and so forth, we can manipulate that. We can see it. We can understand it. But there's a whole, you know, software system, an operating system, including firmware, that directs how the computer runs and operates all the customer-facing, user-facing software. Well, we don't see this, and yet it really directs how our computer operates. So let's take a moment and look at the elements that comprise culture, all right? First and foremost is going to be religion. Now, even if you say, well, now, hold on, I'm not religious, that's fine. You may not be practicing religious in any way or shape or form, but that doesn't mean that religion has not profoundly affected your culture. So, for instance, I'm in the United States, and the United States tends to be a Judeo-Christian society. Now, whether I'm practicing religious or not is pretty irrelevant when it comes to culture. Our culture esteems life, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, be honest, be virtuous, um, you know, practice integrity. These are very Judeo-Christian concepts and values. Now, they are not solely isolated to Judeo-Christian cultures, right? These, these ideas can be found in many, many other cultures as well. But other cultures and their religions may emphasize different factors, such as Buddhism emphasizing filial piety, you know, kind of family um, 
um, worship and so forth. I don't know that worship is the right for, word. Probably more just like um, reverence of the family. Um, and other cultures will emphasize different things. The uh, cultures associated with Islam really value hospitality and loyalty. This is because the religion, Islam, and the Quran, their, their, their sacred writing, their holy scripture, really emphasizes the, in, the, the importance of, being, um, um, of practicing hospitality. Okay, so we have religion. Next, we have political philosophy. The political philosophy that a certain country or region follows really permeates the, the culture in many, many ways. So, for instance, if I am in the United States or many Western cultures as well, um, see democracy as kind of the prevailing political philosophy, well, then it may be that even in meetings we ask for a vote and we, we you know, decide what we're going to do going forward in a corporate meeting based on majority rules. That's kind of a democracy idea versus if we follow more of a socialism idea or a collectivism ideal, we really want to make sure we have group consensus before we move forward. This is how political philosophy can enter into our day-to-day -day expression of our cultural selves. We also then have economic philosophy. Does your culture really emphasize free markets, open and free competition, or does it emphasize um, uh, kind of... Um, uh, how should I put this? The centralized control of key industries, such as we see in socialism and so forth. So, for example, um, economic philosophy might say, hey, to what degree should there be gaps between the rich and the poor? To what degree should there be redistribution of wealth? Well, your, your ideas along these ideas of gaps between rich and poor and redistribution of wealth could very well be founded in the economic philosophies of your particular culture. Next, we have communication, and we're talking both verbal and nonverbal communication. As we're going to see in a little bit, um, not everybody communicates the same way at all. The way that we communicate is, is really driven by our cultural differences. And this is particularly key because what is international business but communication? What is social relationships and, and, um, and um, social behavior but communication, right? So understanding how we express ourselves and how we communicate ideas and feelings and thoughts um, is very important when we look across the globe and try to find ways to work together. We also have social structure, right? And to what degree are members in a given social structure mobile? Different parts of the world have different social structures. Some social structures are very flat, meaning there's not really that many hierarchies within a structure, and the structure is, is pretty permeable. People can move up and down or across a structure pretty well. Other cultures, the structure is pretty darn set, and it's very difficult to change your st structural strata for instance. Next, we have the history of a region or the history of a culture. You know, many of the things that you individually believe uh, to be true, the things that have uh, um, kind of given form to your opinions, are based on what you have experienced in the past. If you had a particularly good or bad experience that really affected you at a fundamental way sometime in the past, it's likely to have um, formed and influenced your opinions today. Well, cultures are really no different, but the history goes back much 
much further, right? Um, so for, for instance, here in the United States, we're a really young country. We're 200 plus years old. I mean, it's, we're really, really young. Whereas some European and Asian cultures go back centuries and centuries, thousands of years. And during those thousands of years, they've experienced all kinds of historical events that have really shaped who they are. And so history has a profound influence on our cultural character. And then we have customs and traditions. These are kind of the fun things to kind of see as you travel around the world to see the different customs and traditions and, and see what people enjoy doing. And then finally, we have stories and mythologies. Um, like histories, stories and mythologies are the stories that cultures tell to basically reinforce a, a value of that culture to reinforce the things that are considered good and noble and desirable versus things that are considered bad and immoral and things to be eschewed. So the stories and mythologies really reinforce cultural norms and behaviors. Now, with that said, I want to go ahead and take a moment and talk about values, norms, folkways, mores, and taboos, things that really kind of, you know, give flavor to a culture, things that we see quite often. Now, as I do this, I want to really make sure that we understand something before we go forward. Cultures are not good or bad, right or wrong. I want to embrace this as we go forward and talk about this. Um, now, to be clear, there are many cultural practices around the world that I really, really, really disagree with. But in the same way, there are many cultural practices that I embrace here in the United States that others really, really disagree with. Um, it's not a matter of right and wrong. Culture is amoral. That's not moral. That's not immoral. It is amoral, meaning it has no moral value. It's like fire. Is fire good or bad? It's amoral. It just depends on how it's applied. The thing with culture, though, is since culture is this invisible operating system running in the background of our lives and how we see the world, it is really tempting to look at another cultural practice and, and, and perceive it as good or bad or moral and immoral. For the moment, I want us to try our best to set that aside and just understand that cultures are different. Different doesn't mean bad. It's just different. Okay? So let's come back over to this and let's look at these ideas. And to do this, I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way so that we can explore this a little better. Let's first look at values, okay? Values are principles that a society believes to be good, right, and desirable. So, for example, in the United States, we value freedom, equity, human rights. Now, I want to be clear. Just because we value it doesn't mean that we are the ultimate personification of these values. Many times values are aspirational. We, we aspire to inhabit these, these values. In Asia, discipline, hard work, frugality are very valued. Uh, in Europe, um, there's a value for humanistic thinking and the arts and rationality. The Middle East really values loyalty, duty, honor, hospitality. Obviously, these are all really positive ideas, right? Um, but different regions, different countries will value them in different ways. Next, we have norms. 
Norms are the social rules and guidelines that prescribe appropriate behaviors. So, for example, um, U.S. and Australia, we tend to be, uh, I say we, in the U.S. and Australia, they tend to be open, friendly, and very helpful when it comes to strangers. But the truth is we are kind of distrustful of strangers and we don't really trust them ultimately. Um, but we don't exhibit this when we work with them directly. We want to be perceived as open and friendly and helpful. Whereas in Europe, they're a little bit more reserved towards strangers and frankly, a little more blunt. And so if somebody from Australia or the U.S. is visiting Europe, um, Europeans may be perceived as rather rude and direct and blunt because, well, gee, you're not being all friendly and nice and bending over backwards to help me. Whereas in the Middle East, hospitality is the driving factor, absolutely core, uh, even when working with strangers. Next, we have folkways. Folkways and everything else leading, you know, from here on are a subset of norms. These are the routine conventions of everyday life, just how you run your life without even really thinking about it. So, for example, in Western cultures, uh, they eat with silverware. Whereas in Southeast Asia, eating with your hands is very, very, very common, even when eating things like rice and curries and so forth. Um, I've been there. I've eaten with my hands, and I, they had to train me. They had to teach me how to do it right. In the U.S., we consider it uh, impolite to burp after eating, whereas in some parts of China and Taiwan, burping after eating is complimentary. It says, I really enjoyed that meal. Thank you very much. In the U.S. and other Western cultures, eye contact is maintained when talking with others, whereas in Asia, they might avert eyes when speaking with others um, to not seem so aggressive. So these are folkways, routine conventions of just living our lives day to day. But then we have mores. Mores um, are the norms of morality seen as central to the functioning of society. We have to maintain these conventions of society if we are going to get along with one another. These are mores. Now, I'll give you an example. Here in the U.S. where I am, uh, drug abuse, dishonesty, public nudity, polygamy, these are considered mores. You don't do these things, and if you do, you're going to get a pretty severe chastisement from society. It's not necessarily illegal, you know. There are laws and there are regulations, but they're definitely mores. But these are not shared universally. For example, in Norway, nudity on public beaches is not a big deal. And in many African cultures, polygamy is common. So mores are not universal, as are folkways, norms, or values. None of these things are universal. In the same way, taboos, they are not universal at all. Taboos are behaviors considered abhorrent and absolutely forbidden. You don't do taboos. As a matter of fact, as I'm sitting here presenting, I'm about to talk about some taboos, and it makes me uncomfortable to even say the words. That is the power of a taboo. So in many cultures, for example, incest, cannibalism, bestiality, these are taboos. And yeah, it was uncomfortable saying the words. Um, but now watch this. In the U.S., we don't eat dog and horse. All right. Dog and horse, eating horse and dog in the U.S. is considered taboo. But in some parts of Asia, eating dog is just fine. In France, eating horse is fine. And yet think about this. In India, 
Eating cow, eating beef is taboo. And yet what is life in the U.S. or Argentina where there's a strong, um, you know, gaucho, I think is the word. I'm not quite sure. I apologize if I got that wrong or cowboy culture. Um, what what are these cultures without eating beef? So you see how one thing that is esteemed in one culture, such as eating beef in Argentina or the U.S., can be a taboo in another culture. Um, <clears throat> India, marrying outside of one caste, foregoing menstruation traditions. These are things that are utterly foreign to many folks, such as myself in the United States, I don't understand a caste system in that way. I don't understand, you know, menstruation traditions. To me, as an American, that is backwards and, and misogynistic, but it is a taboo in another culture. And that's something that I have to respect to some degree. Now, respect to some degree. Let's play with that idea for a moment. And, and this is a real thing that we really need to think about. Universality of human rights versus cultural relativism. Okay? Let's take universality for a moment. Human rights have been granted in the international treaties and conventions, and they're universal apply to all countries and must prevail even when they are in conflict with cultural or religious practices. So, for instance, the picture I have here uh, is talking about female circumcision. We could have the same conversation around the idea that menstruation is dirty or something. Um, it's very, very tempting. I mean, very tempting to the point of where I agree with it. For me to say universality, there need to be a universal recognition of, of human rights. Remember, human rights were a big deal to um, those of us in the U.S. culture. And I like to say that, hey, no matter what country you're in, no matter what your culture, no matter what your religion, there are some things that are just plain wrong. I want to say that. On the other hand, there's also cultural relativism, which is permitting international norms to override the dictates of culture and religion is a violation of state sovereignty. So in other words, it's like, who are you to come into my culture and tell me that something we have practiced for 4,000 years is wrong. What kind of cultural imperialism is that? Listen, you have your culture, and I don't tell you how to live. I have my culture, and you shouldn't tell me how to live. So back off. Who died and made you king? I get that. I really get that. It's not easy. The, the, the kind of dissonance between these two ideas. Very difficult. Um, I like to think that I'm very, very, very um, uh, accepting and embracing of, of international cultures and ideals and so forth. But yeah, every once in a while, I run into one that is so abhorrent to my own culture that I have a hard time processing it. But do I have that right? That's what this is about. Okay, let's continue on and talk about some of these cultural values and, and how they juxtapose, how they compare across different cult, um, countries, different countries. Now, to do this, I'm going to use Hofstede's framework, and I'll put a link to this, uh, to Hofstede's framework down in the description below and to the tool that I've used to bring up these uh, various values. What Hofstede's framework does is it looks at six different um, cultural values, power distance, individualism, masculinity, uncertainty, avoidance, long-term orientation, and indulgence, okay? 
Now, because I am in the United States, I have the, I will be comparing this particular framework with all the other countries I show, but I'm going to include other countries for each one of these values, countries in which I have lived or have done business extensively, so I can speak to it with some level of credibility. So with that, let's look at power distance. Power distance is the extent to, um, to which the less powerful members of a society accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. Okay, let me put that in human terms. There's power, and it's going to be distributed among the people. But to what degree will it be distributed equally? Will everybody have equal power? Okay. And to what degree do they expect or ex accept that it is unequal? So, for example, in Malaysia, they scored a 100. Now, that means that in Malaysia, they are very, very comfortable with the idea of unequal distribution of power. Doesn't bother them. It's fine. And when you look at their political system, uh, it's, a, it's a theocracy. Uh, no, 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 they're in a monarchy, but their political system is their, their official state religion is Islam, and they follow the tenets of Islam very, very closely. And so it's not surprising, I think a light just went out on me, um, that they would be okay with the uneven distribution of power because they're in a monarchy. On the other hand, Israel, oh, oh, no, 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 no. They are not comfortable with uneven distribution of power. When I worked with Israelis, they are very, very in the guts of it. They want to have their say. They feel they should have equal say in just about everything, no matter where they are in the hierarchy. Very fascinating. United States, by the way, scores a 40, whereas Israel, 13. Okay. Let's go ahead and look at individualism versus collectivism. All right. Uh, the degree to which people prefer to act as individuals rather than members of a group. And I know it's a little hidden here. We have United States and China. United States is founded on individualism. They really, it's, you know, I came to this country with $27 on my jacket on my back. Uh, nobody ever gave me anything. I built this from the ground up. I'm a self-made person. All these things are phrases that are very, very familiar to an American. Uh, individualism is, is everything. Versus in China, no, no, China and many other Asian countries practice strong collectivism. The right direction to go is whatever is right for the collective. Even if individuals need to give up some of their own individual rights, if it's good for the collective, then it's the right direction to go. Then we have masculinity and femininity. Um, the degree to which the culture favors traditional masculine values versus feminine values. Now, frankly, I think this is kind of, a, kind of an unfortunate naming of these particular values because I think we kind of get hung up in masculine and feminine, male, female, and I think that might distract us from the main point that Hofstede is trying to make. But so let me go into a little bit more detail here. And I am comparing, I know you can't see it, I apologize, um, Japan and France. So Japan, very masculine country. France, more of a feminine country. Well, now, what do we mean by that? Well, here are some traditionally masculine values, according to Hofstede. Very ego-oriented, live to work, versus more feminine cultures, such as France, relationship-oriented, work to live, right? Um, masculine kind of sees um, uh, work, preference for higher pay, 
versus feminine preference for fewer work hours. Um, masculine, girls cry, boys don't, boys fight, girls don't. Whereas in a female feminine society, both boys and girls cry, neither fight. I really like this last one. Failing is a disaster in a traditionally masculine culture versus failure is a minor incident and just part of life in a more feminine culture. Okay, so that's what we're looking at in terms of masculine and feminine. Then we have uncertainty avoidance. To what degree is a culture fine with ambiguity? How well does it operate in ambiguity? Well, Japan functions in ambiguity just fine. They're very, very comfortable in working with ambiguity. Um, if you know, degree to which a per, uh, people in a country prefer structured over unstructured situations, um, Japanese are fine with that. In Malaysia, scoring a 36, um, which is kind of close to the U.S., which is a 46, um, they want a little bit more structure. They want to know what's expected, what what success looks like, and what tasks they're going to follow to get to that. And then we have long-term versus short-term orientation. All right, long-term orientation looks at the future. Short-term values adhere to the, you know, look at the here and now. China and the United States. China, very long-term orientation. I'm telling you what, the Chinese make plans today that will come to fruition in 30 years. Not exaggerating. Uh, so they look very, very, very long-term. Whereas the U.S., check this out, the U.S. Car scores a 26. I'm always pointing out that if you look at an American corporation, how far ahead into the future do they look? Basically quarter by quarter. They're fixated on the quarterly earnings reports because that's when the stock market is either going to reward or punish them. And so it's difficult for a corporation to think ahead, you know, more than a few years. Uh, the United States government, um, we have term uh, limitations to our to those serving in the government. So two to four years is about as far ahead as you can, you know, look and plan. Sure, in the U.S. we have longer term plans, but those can change at any time, and we know it. So we tend to think more short term. And then the last one is indulgence versus restraint. You know, the degree to which a society indulges or restrains the basic and natural drives related to enjoying life and having fun. Well, in the United States, eh, we're not too good at restraint. All right. Now, 68 isn't the worst out there, right? But pretty much we want to have what we want to have and we want to have it now. Whereas China? Oh, they can totally put off, you know, kind of enjoyment of life and having fun and short-term needs for a greater future. And furthermore, they do this with a collectivist mindset. So you can kind of see the differences here and imagine in all these cases how this can influence business when all these different cultures are coming together and trying to work together. All right. OK. Now, there's also a difference in how different cultures communicate. We have low context versus high context cultures. Now, if we look down here at this chart, we see low context are the Swiss, the Germans, USA, whereas high context tends to be, tends to be Japan, uh, the Arabian cultures, some Latin American. All right, well, what's the difference? Well, low-context cultures, those that we just looked at, 
down below are logical, linear, individualistic, and action-oriented. All right? So they're very clear, direct, and informative. Say what you mean, mean what you say, that sort of thing. When it comes to problem solving, get right to the issue and address it directly. It's not personal. We're just here to solve a problem. So just the facts, ma'am. One, two, three, A, B, C, this, that. We just want to get straight to the point, solve the problem, nothing getting in the way. That is a low context culture. However, in terms of communication, high context cultures, as we see down here, um, they're very relational, collectivist, intuitive, and contemplative, much more ambiguous, much more nebulous, right? In terms of communication, they use formal language loaded with implied meaning, not explicit direct meaning, but implied meaning cannot be understood outside the context around the situation. So this form of communication is alluding to and implying factors that are in the current situation and things that have led up to the current situation. So if you don't understand the nature of what's going on and what brought about what's going on, you're not going to understand the conversation. When it comes to problem solving, a work on the periphery, periphery of an issue to solve it, never addressing it directly. Calling attention to the problem directly is a sign of disrespect and may cause the others to lose face. Now, I have had a great deal of experience working with low context and high context communicators. And I'm going to just go ahead and tell you, I am a very low context communicator, very, very low context. And it has been a challenge for me to communicate effectively with high context cultures. Nevertheless, if we're going to do this successfully, if we're going to work together successfully, we need to know how to do it. Now, just so that we call some things out, if I'm low context, I look at high context people and I think, just get to the point. Just why are you going on and on and on about all these things that have no relevance to what you're talking about? Would you just please get to the point? However, high context cultures look at low context communicators like me and go, you're like a caveman with a rock. You know, ugh, me use words to hit you with, right? We have no finesse, no style. We don't care about relationships. We don't care about, you know, the, the, the situation in which we're in and all the nuances associated with it. We're just like morons with rocks. So you have to understand this is how we perceive one another. And if we're going to work together in international business and relations, we need to understand how this works. There's another thing that we need to take a look at, and that is our perception of time. Um, different cultures perceive time in different ways. So we have M time and P time. M time is uh, monochronic time, all right? Very common in low context cultures such as the United States. Time is something to be parsed out, measured, and managed. After all, time is money. People in M-time cultures often complain that somebody is always late. It's impolite to be late. Whereas polychronic time, very common in high-context cultures, time is something to be savored and invested in. 
and invested in the building of strengthening, strengthening of relationships. This cannot be divided out in nice little neat 15-minute increments. So P-time cultures might complain that somebody is always prompt. Yeah. So in parts of uh, in, in Arab cultures and so forth, it's perfectly fine, in fact, considered polite, appropriate, and expected for you to be about 15 to 20 minutes late. Whereas in Germany, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. That's kind of a difference between PM time and P time. One more here on values is kind of our pace of life. What's the pace of life in a given culture? Now, I know this is a difficult chart to understand, to read, I should say. It's a difficult chart to read. So let me just talk you through the key points. It was a study done that said, okay, this researcher, Levine, said, all right, I'm going to look at the walking speed of a culture. I'm going to look at how fast the post office does its job, you know, when you wait in line at the post office, and how accurate are the clocks in this culture. And he kind of figured, this gives me an overall sense of the pace of life. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pull out the United States, but then I'll show you a couple others. United States, well, when it came to walking speed, we actually walk pretty quick. We rank number six in the world of the, of the countries that he studied. We rate number six. That's pretty quick. When it came to our post office, holy smoke. Have you waited in line at the post office here in the United States lately? It's awful. You're going to spend half a day there. We're 23rd. And accuracy of public clocks? Oh, yeah. You know darn well here in the United States when you're driving along and you see public clocks or clocks at the school, at the school where I teach, Salt Lake Community College, they haven't even changed it from daylight savings time yet. It's an hour behind. We don't care. Public clocks are not very accurate. On the other hand, let's look at Switzerland. Well, when it comes to walking speed, they're third. <laughs> they have places to go, things to do, people to see, get out of my way. Their postal service, number two in the country's study. Postal service, good and quick. I have been at a post office in Switzerland. It's amazing. And clock accuracy, it's Switzerland for crying out loud. Of course, their public clocks are going to be the most accurate you've ever seen, right? But now let's take down here at the bottom. Let's look at Mexico, close friend and trading partner of the United States. Well, in terms of walking speed, number 17. I'll get there when I get there. Now, that's not the worst, right? But, you know... When it comes to the postal speed, oh yeah, it's even worse than the United States. You're going to be there forever. And then when you look at the accuracy of their clocks, 26th. We're 20. So actually, in many ways, United States and Mexico are pretty darn close when it comes to, you know, the, the pace of life. All right. Um, so just something to think about there. All right, so this brings me to the last point I want to bring up. There are lots and lots of cultural differences, lots of cultural differences. And as I also demonstrated earlier, there are some cultural differences that frankly make us really, really, really uncomfortable. And this is going to bring about culture shock. Now, culture shock is inevitable. It's inevitable, and it's expected, and to a certain degree, it can be forgiven. But there's a certain point at which culture shock becomes very problematic and needs to be addressed. So let's talk about how to work our way through culture shock. Now, culture shock starts with one thing. 
we expect everybody to be like us. We really do. Now, I know, I know, I know. You understand that not everybody is like you. And you understand there are differences and so on and so forth. But at a core cultural level in that operating system in the background, we kind of expect everything to be like us, right? So when I'm loading a program into my, you know, PC, if it it expects every program I load into it to be PC compatible. If I try to load in a Mac program, it's going to spit in my face. It expects everything to be compatible with its operating system. Likewise, we expect everybody to agree that cowboys are awesome or that chewing with your mouth open is rude or that showing the bottom of your shoe is rude if you're in an, an Arab, Arab country. Thing is, we're not all alike. Not everybody is like us culturally. And when we see that people are not like us, a cultural divide occurs. I look at a culture that practices one thing that to my culture is abhorrent, um, and a divide occurs. And at this point, this causes an emotional reaction, an emotional response. Fear, anger, disrespect, things like that. Now, at this point, everything that we talked about is understandable, to be expected. It is leveraging normal psychological mechanisms. We are all forgiven for feeling this. We are all forgiven for feeling um, an emotional response when we see a cultural divide. Um, however, it's at this point that we can choose one of two paths. The first path is the path I want to invite you not to follow. What we do is we take this anger, fear, and disrespect as we look at a cultural divide, and we create false attribution about their behavior. Well, they're kind of a backwards people. Well, you know, they're a dirty people. Well, they're not exactly civilized. Well, you know, they're all murderers and rapists. This is where we are creating a false attribution about the behavior of a people based on fear and disrespect. We make up a reason that belittles them and raises up us. We look at their culture as somehow uncivilized, and our culture as the beacon of all things righteous, and push them down. Well, what we then do is we discount them and withdraw from engagement. After all, if they're kind of a dirty, backwards people, I don't need to really engage with them. Unless, of course, I want to come in and be the savior, the cultural savior of who they are and make them a better people. You see how nasty that is? No, no. Or we say, we don't want to have anything to do with you. You stay on your side. I stay on my side. I don't want our cultures mixing. It's just ugly. And yet, come on, you can see it. This is where the majority of our international problems lie. I'm telling you, the majority of the, of the disputes that we have internationally all lie in fear, disrespect, anger, false attribution of behavior, and withdrawal from engagement. What are we going to do instead? I'm going to show you what we're going to do instead. First, we're going to become aware of our reaction. Hey, don't beat yourself up for feeling anger, fear, or disrespect. 
Become aware of the emotion. Become aware that you're feeling it, okay? You're allowed to feel it, but now we need to analyze it. We need to reflect on the causes. Why are we feeling this? You know, they're doing A, I'm used to doing B. Um, where's the disconnect? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I looking at somebody you know, killing a dog and slaughtering it and eating it as abhorrent. Well, because in my culture, and I've got a couple of dogs right down here, dogs are man's best friend. You don't, we anthropomorphize our dogs and you don't do that, right? And you kind of reflect on the causes. And then you kind of let the reaction subside. Emotions kind of need some time to express themselves and to figure themselves out. Let these emotions subside. And then observe and decode the cultural differences in the situation. So if I'm looking at somebody who's eating dog, I can go, well, okay, listen, it's not what I would do. <laughs> I mean, I love my puppies, right? Yeah, I know I said puppy. He's down there. Um, but meat is meat, right? I mean, just because I eat, you know, beef and somebody in India considers that a taboo, well, I don't necessarily feel bad. Well, somebody who's eating dog, therefore, shouldn't necessarily feel bad just because I think eating dog is a taboo. We all eat something that somebody else says is gross, right? Okay. So we kind of decode that. And then we can develop culturally appropriate expectations. We are no longer going to be caught off guard when somebody does something that is different from what we thought they should do based on our own cultural expectations. Now, when we go to a market, we say that there's dog hanging in the market, and it's just the way, way it is. In the same way, when I see beef hanging in the market in the U.S., it's fine. And when I go to France and I see horse hanging in the market, that's fine. We all eat what we eat, okay? And therefore, we can go about and continue to have a relationship with these folks continue to work together to respect one another. You don't have to agree, but you can ex still, you can ex respect the cultural differences, okay? And so there we are, folks. Fantastic job. I really hope you got something of value out of this because for me personally, there's nothing more fascinating than cultural differences. I absolutely love them. All right. Um, have a fantastic day, and uh, we'll see you again later.